All right, well, um, welcome everyone to the association lecture. Thank you for coming. I'm Pia Renius. I'm now president of the SAA, so that's exciting. Uh, I, I love being here with y'all, and it's just the highlight of my year, really. So I hope you're all enjoying the conference. I certainly am. And tonight, it is my uh, distinct joy and honor to uh, to introduce John Cochran, who is our association lecturer this year. So even if you are not a macroeconomist or a Fed economist, uh, chances are you've seen uh, John's work uh, somewhere, maybe everywhere. <laughs> he, uh, looking over his bio and just thinking of all the places I see uh, his work, I, I thought he is the Renaissance, the Renaissance man of economics maybe the Renaissance economist, in the sense that he's contributing on so many levels, which makes him so special. Uh, articles in top academic journals, obviously, papers on MBER, books on Amazon, op-eds in the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Grumpy Economist blog, uh, John is everywhere. And um, he is specifically the Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He's also a senior fellow um, uh, for the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, professor of finance and economics at Stanford Graduate School of Business, <coughs> a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. So, uh, so with that, um, and tonight he'll be talking about the fiscal theory of the price level, and think of your questions. We'll take the questions at the end, and now uh, just join me in welcoming John to the stage. Well, thank you for that, that lovely introduction. Uh, it is really a pleasure and, and an honor uh, to be here uh, tonight. Um, I want to talk to you, of course, about my recent work. What do we all talk to each other about? <laughs> what have we been working on lately? And this is what I've been working on lately. I, I guess we're economists, so I, I don't have to hide that, yes, I'm selling a book. There it is. It's called The Fiscal Theory of Price Level. Wildly overpriced from Princeton University Press, but they do have discounts every now and then. Usually there's one in December, so wait for the discount to, to, to come on, and then let them buy it. Uh, summarizing, of course, lots of other work which you can find on my website, and fortunately I come up come up first when you Google John Carver, so it's easy, easy to find me. So let's get right to work. Uh, you haven't been spending two days at a conference for nothing. You're an anxious for equations, and uh, it being only 6 p.m., and uh, still early for economists, uh, I won't really disappoint you. So what is this uh, fiscal theory of the price level? Let me start with a very simple uh, model. Uh, we wake up in um, uh, you know, a little village somewhere, People wake up with bonds in their pockets, nominal government bonds. First thing they do in the morning is that they redeem the bonds for money. A bond, after all, says I pay the bearer one dollar, so get your dollar, take your money out, and do with it what you will. Now, you could use it for transactions, you don't have to. The transactions demand is completely irrelevant to what we're now. Um, but towards the end of the day, the government requires that you pay money and that you pay money in taxes. So it collects taxes and you gotta give them some money in taxes. And any money that's uh, left over after you pay taxes sits in your pocket at the end of the day. So that's the simple timing. Uh, the notation, uh, ta taxes are a piece. S stands for a surplus, so P times S is the nominal amount of money you gotta pay in taxes. I see that all the Greek letters are not working. That is too bad. None of the equations are in there. Oh well. Um, you have to kind of imagine what the correct Greek letters are. Uh, that the T is its out. Um, so uh, the uh, now the, um, the budget constraint here, if you will, of the economy is that the money printed up in the morning is equal to what's soaked up in taxes in the afternoon, yes, plus and whatever's left over in your pockets. Equilibrium here is it's the end of the world. You don't want to take the money with you. Towards the end of the day, you're going to do what it takes. You're going to try to buy stuff with that money. So money demand will be zero. And what you do, of course, is if you have too much money that you need to pay for taxes, you drive up the price level. So in equilibrium, 
the value, the real value of government debt at the beginning of the period is equal to the surpluses that soak up the money at the end of the period. In the dynamic version of the model, it's not the surplus at the end of the day, it's the present value of uh, all future surpluses that soak up the money. So the price level adjusts so that the real value of nominal debt is the value of real primary surpluses that will retire the debt or think of it as surpluses soak up the money. I went through the rigmarole here with the extra money to emphasize this is not a government budget constraint. This is an equilibrium condition that comes from the fact that people don't want to hold money at, at the end of time. So it comes from people, uh, not, not from some, some mistreatment of uh, budget constraint. And that, I just wiped out a decade's worth of theoretical controversies with that one statement. Intuition should be fairly clear, too. If you're holding on to government debt, and, and we come to, our, to, to the view, you know what, these jokers are not going to pay that stuff back. What do we do? We try to sell the government debt, get rid of it before uh, the time comes that they don't pay it back. Well, uh, the only way we can collectively get rid of government debt is by trying to buy stuff, so we drive up the price of goods and services. And very much just like this is the theory of finance. I, I, I had a previous career as a finance professor. I learned one thing. Price is present value of dividends. So like a two-year-old with a hammer, this is my new nail. Uh, and so it works the same way. If you don't think the dividends are going to be there, you try to sell the stock, the price goes down. If you don't think the surpluses will be there, try to sell the bonds, the price level uh, goes up. Now, what have we achieved? We've achieved something quite special here. Uh, we have determined the price level. We've figured out the endless puzzle of monetary economics is, is why does this stuff, why do we work so hard for these pieces of paper? They're just pieces of paper. Well, the answer is here, quite simple. You need those pieces of paper attached to it. Uh, notice what is missing from what we've done. We've determined the price level, uh, but we have flexible prices. There's no money demand and supply. There's no gold standard. There's no Phillips curve. There's no frictions at all. We've determined the price level without any of the conventional ingredients. One way you can view it is it's a backing theory of money. Money is backed by future taxes, uh, and that's what gives it to the value. Now, this is, of course, very simple, and we still have, oh my gosh, we have a whole 40 minutes of uh, talk to get through. How are we going to do that? Well, <laughs> by adding all the kinds of frictions that you need on this very simple uh, model in order to be useful. And that's what the book really is about, is making this useful. Let's get beyond the theoretical controversies and see how this can talk about uh, events in our world. Applying the fiscal theory of price. So there you have the, um, the uh, theory, again, with the main but that's small enough you can't see it anyway, so I guess it's not going to matter. Uh, real value of nominal debt is the present value of primary government surpluses. Now, in applying it, you might jump to say, ah, debt and deficits cause inflation, bad debt and deficits. But that's not true. That's not what the equation says. It says that inflation comes from too much debt relative to the government's long run will or ability to repay that debt. In, in that sense, like stocks and bonds. It does not mean today's debt is necessarily a problem or today's deficits are necessarily a problem. In fact, the first graph graphs what, what deficits should look like. A good, well-managed government runs big debt and deficits when there's a crisis or a war or a big recession, and then it pays them back over long periods of time. In that first graph, that first path of surplus, of deficit and surplus, there is no change in the present value of future surpluses because the surpluses balance off the deficit and therefore no inflation. That's what governments should and largely do almost all the time. We have to look for inflation on top of that pattern. The danger is, is the second graph. What happens if there's deficits and no plan to repay in the future? That causes inflation. And the tough part for us as economists is how do you tell the first from the second graph? How do you tell these longer expectations? Fortunately, we have an entire theory of empirical finance uh, theory. Sorry, that's a terrible word. We have an entire experience of, of finance that for 40 years, prices, present value, of dividends has struggled with how do we tell whether there's a present value of dividends out there? And copy, edit, paste. This is a recipe for writing papers. The third, last graph is the danger we need to be aware of. Another thing that can happen is the expectations evaporate. Uh, you see the treasurer of a company heading to a plane with tickets to Rio and dollar bills coming out of his pocket. Uh, you know something's amiss, nothing in the current income statement, and the price plunges. Same thing with governments. 
If we lose faith in the government's ability to repay, you can get inflation now, even with nothing going on. So we've got to make this next step reasonable. First of all, it's not just debt and deficits. How do we make this more useful? We have to integrate it with interest rate targets. We have a Fed. The Fed runs interest rate targets. What about that? To do that in this slide, uh, I'm going to put together um, the, the, uh, a very simple agreement. So we're going to keep flexible prices. We'll add the sticky prices in a minute. So the first uh, equation here tells us that the bond price is the expected inverse of inflation, constant real interest rates. Uh, and linearizing to the top equation in the box, interest rate equals expected inflation plus a constant real rate. These are all deviations from the mean. Okay, so that's equation one of our model. Flexible prices, interest rates equal expected. Equation two of our model, we start with real value of debt with the present value of surpluses. Uh, multiply and divide by PT and take unexpected. Delta ET plus one is unexpected. And we just, now B over P is BT over PT that on the left hand side, that's predetermined. So unexpected inflation is driven by revisions in the present value of future surpluses. Bottom equation on the left. Linearizing that guy, we have the second equation of the box. Unexpected inflation is driven by the revision in present value of future surpluses. So there you got it. You have a full theory of inflation now with the Fed. Uh, interest rates that expect inflation, the central bank is, remains powerful. We don't have to throw out anything about central banks. The central bank sets expected inflation, but fiscal policy uh, now is, is responsible for unexpected inflation. And the intuitions get very simple. We know how interest rates and expected inflation works. We've been at that for 40 years. The intuition of the second one is if there is a deficit that won't be repaid by future surpluses, it's got to come from somewhere. We have to inflate away the value of today's outstanding government bonds. So there's a price level jump to inflate away the value of government bonds. That's what gives you the unexpected inflation. Well, there isn't one. There's no unexpected inflation. Now, again, stop. This looks all very simple. It's a dinner talk. It's not even hard equations. Uh, but man, look at what we've done. We have now a full theory of inflation with interest rate targets. There's no end in here at all. In that theory, inflation is stable, completely determinate, no multiple equilibrium, and it's neutral. Neutral meaning higher interest rate means just higher inflation. The same way higher money growth is higher inflation. That's neutral. Well, why is it neutral? Because prices are flexible, of course. You want non-neutrality, we need something going on with prices. But we have a complete economic theory of inflation with an interest rate target, just like MV equals PY uh, would be a, a, the, the baseline theory of flexible prices. Uh, but it's unrealistic. What's unrealistic about it? Again, the, black, the box is my two equations. Interest rate is the expected inflation. Unexpected inflation is the revision in present value of the surpluses. Let's, let's, what happens? What if the Fed raises interest rates in this model? Fed raises interest rates, and there is no shock to fiscal policy. Warning. <laughs> Almost all models that you will see mix the shock to fiscal and monetary policy. It's often off in the footnotes, hard to see. Uh, so we're going to define a, a monetary policy as higher interest rates with no change in fiscal policy. Higher interest rates with no change in fiscal policy, what happens? Exercise. I should have you, have you this is a modern classroom, you have to fill out the clipboard, right? What happens? Well, top equation goes up, bottom equation does nothing, so higher interest rates raise inflation one period later. Oh, that's crazy. Well, that's this model. So if you don't like it, we're going to fix the model. What happens if there's a fiscal shock? That one's clear. Second one, fiscal shock that's going to just devalue a price level jump that then goes away. So that is, when you think about it, of this model, completely sensible. This is the flexible price model. It's just like MV equals PY with totally flexible prices, except with interest rates in the place of money. If you don't like it, add some more ingredients. And that's what we do. We, you know, we start with simple models, and then you add ingredients until you get enough to describe the world. So the obvious uh, ingredient to add here is to keep prices. So now the, the equations on the top left uh, those of you who don't do monetary economics are excused for wishing it was Y network, but um, it's not that bad. The top two equations are uh, taken straight from every New Keynesian model that there is. 
I try not, don't innovate on, on more than one dimension at once, is, is my uh, philosophy here. So what that is, is just in place, you can see the i minus e pi, what we've really done in the top two equations is in place of i, I equals e pi, we have some price stickiness. The top equation is a uh, is curve, where higher interest, higher real interest rates, lower output. The second equation is a Phillips curve, where lower output uh, causes, uh, causes less inflation. So on top of those two standard equations, I have equation three and four, and those just describe government debt. That's the fiscal theory part. It just says government debt goes up if there is uh, I minus pi, if there's a high real return on government debt, and it gets paid off by higher surpluses and the transversality condition. So that's our model, and, and I put it up as an invitation. If you do any monetary economics, you recognize the first two equations, and so that's from Woodford's textbook. Now you can make any new Keynesian model into a fiscal theory model. Just copy the top block of equations, add the lattice to, it's literally an hour worth of work to get this in binary and go, except the answers are totally different. This is a paper writing machine. I keep telling my graduate students, to very little effect, but maybe you will listen where they don't. So uh, that's, that's, what it, that's the model. Let's see what it says. What happens now if there's a fiscal shock? Remember, the previous fiscal shock was fiscal shock leads to price level jump. That doesn't look very realistic. What do we get instead? Well, now, in the purple line, the price level goes up gently and slowly. Oh, yeah, prices are sticky. In the red line, we get inflation. Inflation goes up and then gradually goes away on its own. And in the dashed red line, I mean, measured inflation has changed from a year ago because there is kind of this hump shape response, and some of that comes from the change from a year ago. Why does the nominal interest rate do nothing? Because that's the question. What if there's a fiscal shock and the Fed does nothing? Now, notice this is uh, what happens. There's a fiscal shock, we get a burst of inflation, inflation higher than the nominal interest rate. That means negative real rates. Bondholders are losing money. Rather than an overnight price level jump, People who hold government bonds are seeing their bonds inflated away. Inflated away, that's what's paying for the fiscal shock. We inflate away government debt slowly over a period of years. So inflation can come from nowhere, and inflation can go away all on its own. Why? Because we're simply inflating away a bunch of debt because, there, uh, because of a uh, fiscal stimulus that must be paid. If that sounds like you're going to go to current events, you bet I'm about to go to current events on that. But let's talk about monetary policy. What happens if the Fed raises interest rates and there's no fiscal policy? Now again, that was, that was the unrealistic one last time. Higher interest rate leads to higher inflation in the future. Well, that's what neutrality has to be. Well, what does it look like with sticky prices? Maybe we can get that to go the other way in the short run. So here's the effect of higher interest rates. There's a standard AR1 higher interest rate, uh, but now with no change in fiscal policy, and, and now sticky prices. What happens? Sorry, inflation still goes up. Now, when you think about it, that's got to be that's got to be the answer of the model we've asked. About. The reason inflation goes up is is that um, by saying no fiscal shock, there's interest. When the Fed raises interest rates, there's higher interest costs on the debt. Who pays those? I've assumed here that nobody pays those. So the net interest costs on the debt have to be zero. That means that the higher real rates in the beginning have to be matched by lower real rates at the end, so there's no net interest costs. With the no net interest cost condition, you can see there's no way the pipeline can get away from the I line. So if we need something different if we want it to go the other way around. Models are models. Uh, what's that something different? That something different is long-term debt. So the best I can do is if I unite uh, with these very simple models, if we add long-term debt to the picture, now higher interest rates can temporarily lower inflation. Uh, and this looks very much like what people at the Fed might think higher interest rates do. Now, the mechanism is totally different. This is really just a form of unpleasant arithmetic. All that's happening is that the higher interest rates raise inflation in the very long run. That kills long-term bond prices. That makes short-term bonds more valuable. The only way short-term bonds can get more valuable is to drive down the price level. That's why we get more inflation. Did you follow any of that? Probably not, which is why it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a while for a Fed chair, or the fiscal theory Fed chair, to, to stand up and say that in front of a, an audience of people, but that's the mechanism. At least we have a mechanism that does what you like, lower inflation. Uh, 
Now, um, uh, this is what it looks like with a permanent, uh, permanent interest rate increase. Interest rate goes up and stays up forever. Uh, that one it has roughly the same effect. Inflation goes down and then eventually it goes back up. Here you can see in the long run, the inflation goes up. It has to. It's long run neutral. But in the short run, it goes down. Now, uh, my office has been next door to John Taylor's for a while, so I feel a sort of uh, a collegial need to say something nice about the Taylor rule, and here it is. Um, what happens if there's a fiscal shock? Remember top left graph? Fiscal shock with no monetary policy change, burst of inflation. What if the Fed responds to that with top right graph, raise interest rates, use this long-term debt mechanism to temporarily lower inflation at the cost of future inflation? Add up the two red lines of those graphs, and what do you get? If you do it just right, the two together just right, what you get is the higher interest rate makes just a little bit of inflation that's much more persistent. What that also does in the McKinsey model is it really tamps down the output response. Output, the black lines, is inflation relative to future inflation. So random walk inflation is great for output responses. And that's what adding the monetary and fiscal together does. So it's a good and great thing for a central bank to raise interest rates in response to a fiscal shock like this. What it does is it smooths out the inflation, doesn't get rid of it. We've got to inflate away that debt sooner or later. But by making it later, it smooths the whole business out and, re and removes the output response. And in fact, a policy rule where the interest rate follows inflation automatically achieves exactly that. So what I love about the Taylor rule is, is what we usually consider an insult is in fact praise. It's always the right answer. The questions just keep changing. In, in the old Keynesian model, it's pretty darn good because it stabilizes the economy. In a new Keynesian model, it's pretty darn good because it stops multiple equilibrium. In a fiscal theory model, it's pretty darn good because it offsets other shock and smooths out inflation. Totally different questions, but the answer is, is, is pretty much the same. This is my slide if anytime someone says, you don't get to ask questions yet. Can you add ingredient X? Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about alternative theories and current events. Um, now, the first question you might have is, well, what about monetarism? And here is uh, Milton Friedman and his California license plate, MV equals PY. I'm dying to put real value of nominal debt equals present value of surpluses on a license plate, but I think I might get in even more trouble with the highway patrol than Milton got. Uh, they apparently kept pulling this over and telling him to take away the equal sign. <laughs> now, how does fiscal theory differ from standard monetary theory. We agree on the fundamental proposition. Five trillion dollars, if you drop five trillion dollars from helicopters, you're gonna get inflation. And I noticed that most of monetary episodes of lots of money causing inflation are in fact financing deficits. Well, but the money is just short-term government debt. So it's government debt that's being dropped and helicopters are a beautiful way of, of, of communicating. We're not gonna pay back this debt. So here's some debt, there's no surpluses, go inflate it away. And whether it's money or debt doesn't really matter. So we agree on that. But let me ask a question. Suppose we drop five trillion from helicopters and we announce at the same time, taxes are going up five trillion dollars tomorrow. Will there still be the same inflation? Hmm, maybe not. What if we drop five trillion from, from helicopters, but at the same time the government, the, the FBI comes to your safe and takes away five trillion dollars of bonds? So you're not feeling at all wealthy. There's no wealth effect at all. There's only the portfolio effect. Will there still be the massive inflation of the $5 trillion of money? Maybe not. Friedman was really smart. Your intuition is working off that wealth effect of extra government debt, not the portfolio effect of too much debt versus too little inflation. We don't need to fight about this. Monetarism is a beautiful, logically coherent, wonderful theory. It applies to many places. But in our world, the Fed set interest rates. It does not set money supply. All of our central banks set interest rates and allow money supply to be wherever you want it to be. If you don't set money supply, then that theory just doesn't apply. We need a theory of inflation under interest rate targets, not money supply targets, not because it isn't beautiful, but because that's the way our world works. So let me give you a quick, I'm going to give you a five minute summary of everything we've done in monetary economics for the last. 40 years. What is the theory of inflation under interest rate targets? Now, the standard model that you, you teach ISLM, that you teach to undergraduates, if you and they can stay awake while you do it, 
uh, really is based on adaptive expectations. I wrote some simple equations here to capture it, uh, that um, high real interest rates, lower output, and lo out lower output lowers inflation. Within the red circles, the expected inflation is anchored on yesterday's inflation, the adaptive expectations. If you put the x of the top equation into the second equation, yes, you can do this, even from the back row, you get the inflation dynamics that interest rates affect inflation. And you see, one plus sigma kappa, it's an unstable system. If you just have interest rates constant and interest rate peg, then inflation will spiral away. And that's what Friedman said. Friedman said, don't run an interest rate peg because inflation will spiral away. What the Taylor rule does in this model, so add i equals 5 pi to my top equation there, what that does is it stabilizes that root. So it takes an unstable system and makes it stable. So the Fed's job is sort of like my seal on the bottom. It takes an unstable system and by moving interest rates more than one for one with the ball, stabilizes the ball. That's kind of the standard view of things. Is this our view? Ugh. If we do this, we say that adaptive expectations are not just icing on the cake, fun dynamics. They are always and everywhere a necessary component. We have no economic theory of inflation if this is the simplest that we can do. Let's try and do that. And in fact, we have. So starting in the 1990s, new Keynesian models came along with rational expectations. Same model. We just put ET pi t plus 1 in our interest rate in the first equation and ET pi t plus 1 in our Phillips curve in the second equation. But changing pi t minus 1 to pi t plus 1 changes the entire way the model works. Now, inflation is stable, but the problem is it's indeterminate. It's stable that if you peg the interest rate, inflation goes away on its own, but there's multiple equilibria, and things will just bat around one multiple equilibria. So the original doctrine was you can't run an interest rate peg because it's unstable. The, the Sergeant and Wallace interest rate doctrine is you can't run an interest rate peg because it's stable, but indeterminate. You'll get sunspot volatility. The new Keynesian model solves that by, again, the Taylor principle. Same principle, totally different effect. Now the Taylor principle <coughs> destabilizes, intentionally destabilizes, an economy that is stable on its own. Stable as Professor Calculus down there and what the Fed is imagined to do is destabilize the economy. It, the Fed turns the red paths into a green path. Why? To pick one of the multiple equilibria. Well, if you thought my description of monetary policy was going to get, get you kicked out of the Fed, try this one. The central job of monetary policy is to intentionally induce hyperinflation or hyperdeflation in response to unwanted multiple equilibria in order to select multiple equilibria. Good luck with that one, especially explaining. Central banks just don't do that. Read their websites. They resolutely say we stabilize inflation. If inflation gets out of hand, we're going to bring it back. Not if inflation gets out of hand, we're going to kill the economy because we didn't want you jumping to that equilibrium. It's a beautiful theory, but it just doesn't apply to our world. So where does fiscal theory fit in all this? Same model. The problem of the rational expectations model is we, na we nailed E pi, but we didn't nail down what pi minus E pi is going to be. The unexpected inflation was all the, the multiple equilibrium. Well, our, our fiscal theory equation that's down there, unexpected inflation is the revision in the present value of the future surpluses. That solves the missing multiple equilibrium problem. And so now we have a, a complete economic theory of inflation under interest rate targets. Inflation is stable. Yes, it says that under an interest rate peg, inflation is stable, so long as there's no fiscal moves, and determinant, no multiple equilibrium, and long-run neutral. We finally have it. And as I hope I've given you a sense from my little tour, it's the only theory we have that does those things. So people say, how do you test it? And the first answer is, against what alternative? You need a coherent alternative that can plausibly describe today's world under today's institutions. As I do it, this is the only half, so you better make it work. But good luck, maybe you can find one. Now, this all seems pretty radical, so let's go look at the world. Let's go look at history and current events to think about fiscal theory versus the other theories that I just showed you, and, and you can bring up in the question any more theories we have. So let's go look at, at, at current events. The first thing I, I showed you was this rather remarkable 
doctrine, and I'll, I'll use the word, it was doctrine of monetary policy, that an interest rate peg is unstable. Go read Milton Friedman's 1968 American Economic Association Address. Too bad he didn't get at the SEAs. He should have, right? Uh, but uh, the, the 68 AA address, you cannot run an interest rate peg because it's unstable. And read the new Keynesians. You cannot run, when the interest rate hits the zero bound, we're going to have multiple equilibrium volatility in the second, 70s and lower. What happened? They didn't know. What happened when we hit the zero bound? We hit the zero bound, and was there spiraling inflation or deflation? It was widely predicted. Go read all the op eds in the New York Times. Here comes the great deflation spiral. We got the zero bound, we'll get deflation, real interest rates are high, that will send deflation down worse, spirals away without control. Hit the panic button. It did not happen. Fiscal theory, and that's a completely correct prediction of that model. Fiscal theory, completely fine. We just saw inflation stable and determinate under an interest rate. Now you might say, what about fiscal policy? Wait a minute, fiscal policy wasn't great. That's true. But fiscal policy, there wasn't any particularly fiscal news during the long, uh, long quiet of the world. And in fact, it's not just the US. Japan has been at the zero bound for 27 years. Now, you'd think if, if a deflation spiral, instability, was going to break out, it would have broke out in 27 years. But no, interest rates are stuck at zero, inflation trundles along. It was a big surprise. Uh, but yes, it looks like inflation can be stable and determined, even at an interest rate. What about uh, our monetary friends? Well, we got that experiment too. It's kind of lovely. We've seen the crucial experiments in the last 10 years. Um, during the quantitative easing era, uh, our central bank set off a, a open market operation. I take your treasuries, I give you cash uh, of unprecedented, unimagined size. Reserves used to be 10 billion, they were 3,000 billion. So ask anybody who graduated from the University of Chicago in the 1960s, what happens if there's a 3,000% increase in reserves? They would say, we leave Zimbabwe in the dust. Uh, we'll see the mother of all hyperinflation. Nothing happened. Now, we're arguing about 10 basis points of long-term interest rate effect. Nothing happened to inflation. But this was an atom bomb. We set off what was supposed to be an atom bomb when we're talking about was it a cherry bomb or a firecracker? And that, that really tells us. Next, what happened, recent events, what happened in 2021, 2022? And this is a puzzle for standard monetary theory. Uh, here's the graph, just to remind you of, of current events. In uh, uh, February of 2021, inflation broke out suddenly. And not due to any monetary policy shock. The Fed had lowered interest rates to zero, like they always do in a recession, and, and we're kind of doing their thing. I've done this many, many times before. Uh, so first puzzle, where did inflation come from? Second puzzle, now inflation is higher than interest rates, and if interest rates are doing nothing, every standard monetary theorist will tell you with interest rates below inflation, inflation is going to spiral away to hyperinflation. You need to get interest rates above inflation and redo the 1980s, except for my unfortunate haircut back then, and induce a big recession, and that's the only way to get inflation down. And look, inflation kind of went away all on its own. Eventually, the Fed started raising rates, but we still, well, where's the famous recession? <laughs> Inflation's going away without the huge, without, without, when I was young, 20% interest rates and 10% in inflation. Now we have one or 2% here. And there. So what happened? Well, obviously what happened was, I hear I plotted now in black, the federal debt. We did, in fact, drop $5 trillion of money from helicopters. We wrote people checks. A lot of that was good. I don't want to say that we should have done nothing, you know, we didn't want the American economy to crater, but I think we, we, uh, we overdid it. Uh, anyway, for whatever reason, we sent people $5 trillion worth of checks. Uh, surprise, surprise, we got inflation. I have to, the, the little one is uh, uh, some personal humor. I sent the uh, drafts of fiscal theory that to Princeton University Press right there. Uh, uh, my introduction said, you know, we haven't seen inflation since the Reagan era. I've been working on this since the Reagan era. I've got my book. So maybe someday, you know, dust off the three copies they all sell, take it down, might be useful. I got to I got to write a new introduction. I'm probably the luckiest economist in the world. By the way, it said don't print up five trillion dollars of cash and hand it out, you'll get some inflation. Uh, so I was lucky on that one. But of course, what we had was a fiscal helicopter. And just to remind you, 
Uh, here's the graphs, you know, there's theory on the bottom left, here's data. If you drop $5 trillion on the people, inflation will come with no change in interest rates. And it will inflate away the debt. First puzzle solved. Second puzzle, the inflation will go away even if the Fed does nothing. Why? Because we're inflating away a one-time fiscal shock. Once that's inflated away, it's inflated away. The Fed doesn't need to raise interest rates to make it go away. What if the Fed starts raising rates? That helps the easing of inflation. The warning, that tends to make the inflation a little more, uh, a little more persistent. So we've got, uh, uh, at least there is, I don't want to claim this as proof. The first step is there exists. The second step is for all. But at least there is a coherent fiscal theory argument, and it's very simple for what just happened. And I think, you know, that if I can convince you there is at least a plausible argument, we're, we're at least in the range to talk about it. Um, let's go back to the 1980s. In fact, um, uh, the 1970s and 1980s are held out as, as the classic um, experience that tells you monetary policy alone is in charge of inflation. And so there you see the uh, unpleasantness of the 1970s, three waves of inflation. By the way, if you're worried about, you know, right now, take a look at 1975. Inflation goes away, kind of all on its own, interest rates go down all on its own, and then things get, things, and then another shock hits. So uh, just because things are going away, uh, re remember uh, when, uh, when disco came and killed the economy. Oh, sorry, that's a different story. Um, <laughs> Then we got the big inflation in 1979, and the classic story is inflation went up, Volcker got tough, raised interest rates, and those high real interest rates killed off inflation. The seal moved his nose way over on the other side of the ball and pushed the ball back where it was. Uh, but that wasn't all that happened in the 1980s. And the question, the problem from the fiscal point of view, and the problem the Fed is going to face right now, when you have high real interest rates, that raises the interest costs on the debt. And right now, that's four times a bigger problem than 1980. When our Fed raises interest rates 1%, real interest rates of 1%, that's 1% 1 of GDP, more, de more deficit, and less taxes come, taxes come or spending gets cut. That's a lot of money. Uh, so where did, the in where did the interest costs on the debt come from? There's the interest costs on the debt. You can see that throughout the 1980s, interest costs on the debt were, were large. Where did those interest costs come from? They came from tax rates. The 1980s was a joint monetary, fiscal, and microeconomic, it turns out, form. It was not just monetary policy. Interesting things happened in the 1980s. The tax rate, the top marginal tax rate, was cut from 70% to 28%, along with a big uh, base broadening and a lot of deductions and exclusions. Uh, there was a social security reform. Uh, things that are unthinkable in today's politics actually happened back then. That bipartisan social security reform, which took care of a lot of the long run fears about deficits. There was a lot of deregulation, and for one reason or another, possibly luck also, there was a lot of economic growth. So tax revenue started streaming in. And the blue line here in the second one tells you the primary surplus. By the late 80s, and especially in the 1990s, the government was raking in money and, in fact, paid off all of those higher interest costs on the debt and the present demand levels. It was a joint fiscal and monetary and microeconomic reform. By contrast, lots of Latin American countries routinely try the monetary part, but don't solve the deficit part. Inflation goes down for a year or two, and then bing, it's right back again. Just to remind you uh, uh, another lesson from the 1980s, painless disinflation is possible, and with joint fiscal, monetary, and usually micro reforms. This is a plot of the price level in Germany after the post-World War I uh, hyperinflation taken from Tom Sargent. Look at the vertical axis. <coughs> It's in log scale, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15. That looks like a physics lecture, not a, uh, an economics lecture. Uh, so, and, and then it stopped. I mean, it stopped dead. Boom. Zero. What happened? When it happened, there was a fiscal reform. The, they, they, they reformed the Treaty of Versailles so that Germany didn't have to pay all the reparations, and also a big fiscal reform inside Germany. Uh, the fiscal reform convinced people, aha, we're going to stop printing money to cover deficits. Interest rates went down, money growth went up, and actually short-term deficits went up because the credibility that you pay back your debt went up. 
So all the signs went wrong. There was no high interest rates. There was no recession. The economy boomed. There was no tight money growth. They printed lots of money with the real side of money. Uh, and, and so a joint fiscal, monetary, and microeconomics, if, if it's credible, can be painless. It's something that can happen. Uh, that is, uh, wait, wait, I lost my future uh, because I am the grumpy economist. Uh, so let's look briefly towards the future uh, with our fiscal theory uh, uh, view in mind. Of course, uh, this is the top graph you'll recognize. This is the latest Congressional Budget uh, Office projection of debt to GDP, and the bottom is the projection of our deficits. That, that little spike there on the left is World War II. We are now uh, hopefully not going into World War III, but we have the debt of the country that our country had after the end of World War II. Now, this is a projection. This is not a conditional expectation. If people believed this is what was going to happen, we would have had the hyperinflation already, right? So in one sense, it might be optimistic that there's chances to reform it. On the other sense, it's pessimistic. Notice that where our debt came from was not a steady ramp up from the 1990s, but rather two big surges. We get into debt sensibly when we have big crises. Uh, I don't think all crises are over forever. So in the black line, I, I drew what is more likely to happen on current policy, that we'll trundle along until the next big crisis, and then we'll borrow again. So what could happen here? Uh, I think bond markets and people are, are kind of expecting this is a wonderful country. Sooner or later, we fix the structural deficit problem. America's not going to have a, a sovereign debt crisis. But uh, you know, bad things that happen around the world can happen here. So the danger is that people will lose faith that uh, it gets fixed and want to be the first one out, the first ones out the door. And treasuries already are getting a little, it's getting a little soft in the treasury market. The bigger danger, the one that keeps me up at night, is what happens in the next big shock. Suppose there's a geopolitical shock, and I, I don't want to be a downer by naming it, but you, you can think of geopolitical shocks. Um, well, I'll name one. Suppose there's a blockade of Taiwan. Financial crisis like you've never seen. Uh, Pacific trade comes to a halt. Or well, recession, big recession on the way. What does Uncle Sam do? We need five to ten trillion dollars step to bail out the entire banking system, once again, uh, stimulus, keep the economy going, and probably this time to actually ramp up the defense budget. So Uncle Sam goes to the markets and says, I want five, ten trillion of new savings right now. Well, the last time we tried this, it, we ran into the brick wall of inflation. Brick wall of inflation was actually a very salutary lesson for all of us economists. Ten years of secular stagnation, you just need aggregate demand, endless amounts of debt, don't worry about it. There's an insatiable appetite for debt. That all ended the day inflation hit 10%. We're a supply that's very economy. There's limits on how much debt new debt uh, markets want. So what I worry is in the next big shock, uh, that's when that's when it, it falls apart quickly without much chance of doing anything. And of course, in the meantime, uh, the Fed is trying to borrow up. The Fed, I think, got lucky with inflation that went away on its own because the large stimulus happened, but we're now heading into a second fiscal expansion. What are we doing with $2 trillion deficits with a booming economy? Uh, and if the Fed wants to raise higher interest rates, then it raises interest costs. If it raises interest, it, it, the point is to induce a recession. The point of higher interest rates is through the Phillips curve to have a bit of a recession. That's going to induce stimulus and bailout payments. So hot monetary policy causes fiscal problems, and if fiscal policy doesn't respond as it did in the 1980, or if it can't respond, then there's just more gas in the inflationary fire. So even the Fed may, may discover that under fiscal constraints, monetary policy is, is a lot less effective than it should. Well, I was supposed to end on a positive note. Actually, I'll try to end on a positive note. It can all be fixed. These are self-inflicted wounds. A sensible country knows how to reform its finances. Let's just hope they do before all this depressing stuff happens. That's the end slide. So I've got some time for questions. Are there any questions? We have a microphone today. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the, the really great talk. I have a question. So thinking about the interaction between the, the monetary authority and the 
fiscal authority, who has the, who needs to have the ultimate monopoly over creating a dollar in your theory. So it seems that if the government, if the fiscal authority just has too low primary services relative to the normal level of debt at a given price level, two things can happen. Either you impose that the normal debt has to be risk-free, so that you force, in the end, the central bank to just print money in case the tax revenue starts low, or if the central bank will refuse to do that, the government that will simply trade at a discount. Why does that happen? So well, think about the Greek case, for instance, right? So Greece obviously does not have the normal to create euros, and there's no inflation there. But that just creates a big discount. So uh, not just trades at discount; it trades at discount because well known default is coming. So if you, you, got, you either got a you got a lot of debt, you got to have tax revenue to pay it off, you got to inflate it away, or you got to default. Those are your options. I don't, I don't know if there's another way uh, that happens. And right, those are your options. <coughs> I should have talked longer. <laughs> you don't know what a struggle it was for me to you know, not go on for two hours on my favorite topic. So, thank you for this great talk. Uh, I have a question regarding to fiscal policy. So, in, in the case of monetary policy, it's very easy to implement, the, implement like economic policies directly. But in the case of fiscal policy, you depend a lot on what happens with the Congress. Uh, the authorizations to, to, to make these fiscal reforms to react to moments like the ones that you were mentioning. So, wouldn't it be a, a, a good policy to uh, to have like a, peace, a more flexible fiscal policy? So, let's say like you have uh, taxes that could be changed directly by the by the treasury. Like having something more flexible. Uh, oh boy, thank you. Uh, flexible. Um, so I should have mentioned the, the way out is always growth. So if you have a lot of debt, um, yeah, if, you know most countries, the U.S. government spending is like 43, 44 percent of GDP overall state and local government. Europe is 50 percent of GDP. The average tax rate is 50 percent, uh, and for everybody who pays a higher margin rate, somebody pays a lower margin rate. So. The chance of really squeezing it out by higher taxes, it's going to at least cause some economic damage. You don't have to be on the left side of the left, but it's austerity is unpleasant. Uh, but if you can allow the economy to grow, then you get more tax revenue without more tax rate. That's that's the, the way, and historically, you know, governments that have paid off their debt, it's, it's by growing, uh, not, not by austerity. Now, what you see here is, uh, uh, I'm going to translate what you said into uh, because what you said was actually rather revolutionary. We have independent monetary policy. So technocrats said monetary policy, but they have a limited mandate. The key deal in a democracy is you get to print the money, but you don't get to hand it out to your buddies. You have to only lend it to people, and you have to pay attention to employment, unemployment and the price level, which means you're not supposed to be paying attention to anything else because you're an independent technocrat. It's kind of a puzzle. If you're a fiscal theorist, what's the easiest way to create inflation? Throw money out the window. What's the easiest way to stop inflation? Go take money from people. That's called taxes and transfers. And there's a reason we don't let independent technocrats tax people's money, because that's the most inherently political thing you can have. So it's kind of funny. We have this central bank in charge of the inflation, and the one most effective thing it could do about inflation, it's not allowed to do. Why? Because we want it to be independent. And politically independent agencies can't go around and hold any gun to your head and say, give me the money, I want to slow down inflation. Which gets me to your point. So I think where you're going is you want the level of taxes to be set somewhat more independently than this messy business about Congress and so forth. Well, I'll answer that question, then you get to ask the question really well. Now, that sounds great. And, and uh, you know, my friends in Europe seem to like that idea. We'll just hand it to some commission uh, somewhere. Well, actually, my friends in Europe don't like that idea. <laughs> That was a bad joke. Um, but you can see the problem. Taxing and spending are inherently political. I, I think, uh, you know, we, we, what we need is a functional Congress. Now, Congress, uh, good, well-run countries, have budget rules, and they, and they pay attention to their budget rules. 
So I, what I would like to see is not removing authority from Congress to some independent agency or rule, but for uh, Congress to follow appropriate multi-year budget. You know, what, what year it is, they try to have these debt and deficit rules, have annual budgets, and what I'd like to add to it is the budget process should say, if we're seeing a lot of inflation, we got to raise taxes and lower spending. If we have deflation, we want to commit to the opposite, make inflation a, a part of it. That's, so I put up this graph. This graph was the inflation targeting countries, which I think have an implicit version of that sort of thing. The central bank handles monetary policy. The, the um, governments uh, promise to pay back their debt at that inflation, meaning raise taxes if, if inflation gets, uh, gets tough. So I think uh, the, the right answer is um, back to what we used to have, a coherent budget process that, that pays attention to, hey, we had a lot of debt, we need to stop worrying about paying it off. Now, that wasn't the question. Right. Yeah. But it was a long answer. You know, it was a different speech. I hope it was a good speech because that wasn't the question. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks for your great talk. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding of about a lot of countries that are overspending and end up getting hyperinflation is that it doesn't really happen when they're having these big deficits. It happens eventually when they get to the point of unpleasant monetarist arithmetic. And do you think that that's correct? And I would also add, um, it looks like Argentina's going to have a new president and they could potentially have dollarization on the table. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so hyperinflation dynamics are very interesting. There does seem to be, and uh, this is why fiscal theory is tough, because it's about the quantity of debt and deficits relative to expected repayment. And that's that nebulous thing that's hard to measure. And that's what's made financial economics. So I, I want to give you some advice if you want to do a fiscal theory paper. Do not take somebody's forecasts of deficits, deaths and deficits, discount them back, figure out what the value of government debt should be and compare that to actual value of government debt. It's a natural thing to do. It's a terrible idea. Why? Because your forebears and your ancestors spent 40 years on this. They tried to do analysts' forecasts of earnings, discount them back, find the stock price, and say, oh, it's not the stock price. Heaven's puzzle. And, and after 40 years, we realized that is, there's an observational equivalence theorem, there's the existence of a discount factor theorem. That's just an empty thing to do. It's not a right or wrong thing to do. Don't, don't do that. But that's what makes it tough. So when is, there is a tipping point. And some countries have 40% debt to GDP. Argentina's had crisis at 40% of the GDP. Well, they lost faith in 40% of GDP. Japan's got 260% of GDP, and, and you know, it's still waiting here. Uh, but uh, that, that moment, of, in fact, when you look at the fiscal theory, it, it does have a lot of this bank run. It, it's, it, it, a lot of it comes out of rolling over short-term debt. Joe and Jane aren't sitting at their, at, their, at, their, at their breakfast table saying, oh, what's the forecast of the government deficit in 2035? No, it's, a, it's two things. It's a general feeling of confidence in the institutions. They'll pay it back sooner or later. Plus, most well, there's debt's short term. So really thinking, is there going to be someone around to buy the debt next year when I want to turn it in? Well, that's, you know, you could feel the run coming right now uh, about loss of faith. And, and that's, well, that's just what the equations scream at you. So in, in part, the fact that we can't forecast when it comes out tells us that the theory is right. Now, you asked about Argentina. I'm all for dollarization. <laughs> uh, it's, it may be separate from fiscal theory. I, I don't want to comment on Argentine politics because my Argentine friends tell me it's all okay, chaotic. Uh, but um, the argument against dollarization is that a clever central bank can carefully devalue the currency out of its shocks and just artfully devalue the currency only when needed to offset certain shocks and then revalue it to, and, and, and that this flexibility it is, uh, is so important. Well, Argentina's experience of its central bank and its government, because it's fiscal as well as monetary policy, artfully inflating only just enough to, uh, so, so what, what, what signing on to someone else's currency does, you know, I do dollarizing Argentina or the euro in Greece, it's a tremendous recommitment. It says we will not be able to inflate away our bonds to get out of the next sovereign trouble or to get out of the next trouble, whatever it is. Now, pre-commitment is time against the past. It's costly, 
ex post Greece, oh boy, was that painful for Greece. But Greece's interest rates went down from 15, 20% in the 90s, down to like 2% when it came the euro. Why? Because Bonner said, oh, they're pre committed. They can't devalue again. We'll give them tons and tons of money at really cheap rates. So pre commitment, which hurts ex post, is really valuable ex ante. And for that same reason, I think Argentina should join the, the US dollar zone for exactly the same reason I think it was great for Greece to join the Eurozone, but just don't overdo it again. <laughs> uh, anyways. So thank you for your, your talk. Um, bondholders were clearly important for your theory. And coming out of 2020, there were some people who made some very like public predictions that we're not going to have inflation and don't worry about it. And those predictions were based on like five, uh, the break-even inflation rates that are based on bond markets. So I was just wondering if, if you were surprised that some of those inflation measures did not increase sooner or, or larger than, than they did. Yeah, it's interesting how, I, I was hoping that my graph was gonna show uh, something that it didn't, but I'll, I'll just I'll put up the inflation graph. Uh, it's very interesting that um, uh, this inflation, when it broke out, was so unexpected. Now, now I said it was coming, but I've been saying it's coming for 10 years now, so I'm kind of disqualified. I'm the guy holding around, going, watch out, the world's about to end up. Larry Summers saw it. He, he just did his basic ISLM on the back of his envelope and said, it's going to cause inflation. Which would be good. But you're absolutely right. Uh, professional forecasters never saw the inflation coming. The Fed, the Fed's forecasts never saw the inflation coming. Uh, and bond markets did not see the inflation coming. Now, I wanted the graph I was hoping was up there. Well, I won't go searching for graphs. Make a graph, go to Fred after that seminar. Make the graph of the 10 year rate of inflation from the 1970s. And bond markets never saw the inflation coming. You'll see the 10 year rate kind of, the 10 year rate kind of goes, it, it does its slow trend thing. But the waves of inflation come and go. And the 10 year rate does not rise ahead of the inflation, and it doesn't fall ahead of the deflation. So, it, so it's, it's a surprise to markets as well. Uh, now, why, is it, why, so why was it such a uniform surprise? It's not just debt and deficits. It's debt and deficits relative to expectations of future repayment. So the difficult, I, I kind of glossed over because I was trying to uh, keep to my time limit here. The difficult thing about the big debt, um, the big debt story for our current inflation is why now, why not 2008? There was a big debt. Why did people not want to hold this debt as savings, which they did last time, and go try to go out and spend it? Well, there are differences. We, we handed it as cash to people. Uh, there was, uh, in 2008, there was um, a lot of talk about deficit now, but repayment later. Whereas this time, there was no talk about how we're going to repay. The only talk was about interest rates are low forever, don't worry about it. They Congress scrapped the pay for deals. So this one, if you believe politicians at all, this one was, we have no plans on how to repay it. Uh, and the last one, there was the interest rates went down, so interest costs on the debt really bailed us out uh, for 10 years. That's not gonna happen again, it's not happening. So there's reasons, but to your question, uh, it's not, you know, even I wasn't quite as, as here it comes, here it comes, I'm sure about it, because I can never be really sure of what do people expect will be repaid versus what will not be repaid. Uh, forecasting inflation is hard. Forecasting inflation will always be hard, and that's about what we know about inflation. <laughs> and part of the Phillips curve makes it hard. We read the Phillips curve. Inflation is expected inflation at the point, and the big part is expected inflation. So uh, it's just like stock prices. Price today is expected prices tomorrow. Well, if you knew inflation was going to go up tomorrow, you would have raised the prices today. We'd already have inflation today. So in some sense, it's forgivable because. We haven't seen a fiscal inflation like this in a long time, and, and because it's genuinely hard to forecast, and it always will be. Uh, that's kind of loose. I, I wish I had something more definite for you, but that's the best I can do. This will be the last question. Yeah, how does this analysis apply to a country like Argentina, who seems to be always be, being bailed out by an organization whose the expectations are all that rational? Oh, I, I thank you. I said something wrong. I said the only way out of a debt crisis is to uh, raise tax revenue, which usually means growth, not tax rates, uh, it, or to default or to inflation, inflate. The third way out of a debt crisis is get someone else to pay it off. 
uh, <laughs> which is how, they, how it's been run in Europe for a while. Uh, so if Argentina can get uh, outsiders to bail out its debt, well, then there's a way out. But Argentina's had bouts of inflation and devaluation, so they didn't, they didn't get it all bailed out by, by other people. And uh, uh, eventually, so eventually that one is going to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan.